Imagination is everything. I can't remember who wrote those three words in that order, but it seems he summed up it all. Imagination is everything. Our lives will reflect the way we use our imagination. The child imagines himself walking like the adults he sees above him. As soon as he can walk, he wants to run. As we reach successive plateaus in life, we begin to imagine ourselves reaching the next one. And thus our imaginations lead us on from one idea to another through every day and every year of our lives. But if we're not careful, our imaginations can lead us into mazes of confused complications from which we may find it difficult to extricate ourselves. So it's a good idea, as we use our imagination to always strive for simplicity, to avoid the complicated. Remember the three main departments of living, family, how we spend our days, work and leisure, and income. If we're wise, we'll work toward keeping each as uncomplicated as possible, as interesting and as rewarding as possible, but at the same time, simple and straightforward. Are we living the lives we want to live, or are we living stereotype lives based on phony values? Usually, they're a combination of both, a kind of Compromise, which says surely other people must have some idea of what constitutes the good life. After all, there are so many of them. But when we look closer, we see that they're living shadow lives, as Mumford calls them. In competition, ice skating, you've seen a couple match each other's movements almost perfectly. It's called shadow skating, I believe. They try to match each other's movements so perfectly that each might be the other's shadow. In any sort of neighborhood, you will tend to find people living much the same way. Their homes, landscaping, furnishings, and lives are typified, if by anything at all, by an almost total lack of imagination. Imagination, like anything else, needs fuel for production. You can't have something from nothing. Thomas Edison said, I'm a sponge. I want to know the answer to everything. With his great lifetime inventory of information, he could assemble an incredible array of new combinations and permutations. Electric light is a combination of elements, and so is any good idea, or any bad idea for that matter. Most of us make the mistake of not asking, why? Why do I live here, in this house, rather than in some other house? Why this life, instead of another life? Why this work, instead of other work? Why these rewards, instead of others? Now, this doesn't mean we'll change anything necessarily, but at least we'll be living lives that have been examined and found to be to our personal liking. We'll know that we're not living the lives we're living simply because they reflect and are pretty much composite copies of the lives we see about us. There should be, to my way of thinking, deep main currents in our lives. Our family lives, our work, and our leisure, and our rewards in the form of income. Our family lives should be good and richly satisfying. What is our input here? How are we using our imaginations to bring meaning, charm, and love to our family relationships? It's an ongoing process that should become richer and more meaningful with the passing of time. As we grow older, we should come to love each other more, instead of it being the other way around. Imagination can bring this about, making allowances for unmanageable neuroses or even psychoses that may crop up. I've often thought of producing appointment calendars with weekly reminders that we should think of something interesting to do for those we love, to let them know we don't take them for granted. A dinner out, a weekend trip, flowers, a card, a phone call, a gift— Maybe nothing more than a big hug in the words, I love you very much. The five most important words in the language when arranged in that order. Or planning a really interesting vacation six or eight months in advance, and instead of waiting until the last minute and finding yourself with nothing very interesting to do. How about your home? Is it what you want? H.L. Mencken once commented that the average home is a house of horrors, and doesn't reflect poor taste so much as it reflects no taste at all. People tend to order their steaks medium and their homes and lives the same way. Medium rhymes with tedium. The family is the most important part of the life of most of us. What good is accomplishment if there's no one with whom to share it? What good is anything if there's no one with whom to share it? And since the family is first in importance, it represents a fertile field for the imagination, not just for the woman in the family, but for the man, and hopefully the kids as well. Family creative thinking sessions are a lot of fun, and a never-ending source of good ideas. Check every idea for basic simplicity. Avoid complication whenever possible. Next, imagination as it applies to the way we spend our days, our work, and our leisure. Let's take them in order. No matter what it is we want, if it's within the realm of reality, we can get it through imagination applied to our work. Nothing now being done by man is being done the way it can and will be. Everything will be done much better. Not can be. Will be. Whether it's the result of our applied imagination or not. 
People who resist change in their work are impediments to progress, yet the first words the new person on the job usually hears are, now this is the way it's done around here. A business leader made the comment that if we're doing anything this year the way it was done last year, we're obsolete. Now that's an extreme generalization, but deserves careful attention. In most things, it's true. Now, while getting new ideas in business is usually the best way to guarantee unpopularity, it's still the only way to renewal and growth. People resist new ideas from the top to the bottom of an organization, especially if it's an older organization. Championing a new idea is a lonely business. But if you believe it's a good idea, if your research causes you to believe it will be a significant benefit, and the costs and disruption necessary to test the idea are not completely out of line with its ultimate benefits, then fight it through. Do it as diplomatically as you can, make as few enemies as possible, but fight it through if you believe in it. The object of management is not to be loved by the people in the organization. It's to make things happen most profitably for all concerned, particularly the customer. People historically have stood in the way of virtually every good idea, and especially if it isn't theirs. Your good ideas can lead to your dismissal from an organization. But ideas are more important than a job. With good ideas, you have independence. There's always a way to succeed. A friend of mine found he couldn't get his ideas through the board of directors. He resigned, and beginning at about the age of 60, he built a $300 million a year business on his rejected ideas. Walt Disney used to ask ten people what they thought of a new idea. If they were unanimous in their rejection of it, he would begin working on it immediately. Our world today consists of thousands of things people once thought were impossible. How many good ideas have you followed through to completion in your work during the past year? A business whose very beginning and success were based on innovative imagination will become a model of stodgy convention with a few years of good profits. You know, Arnold Palmer's success as a truly great golfer was based on his ability to never try to play it too safely, too cozy. He was never foolhardy, but he would try the more testing shot when others would have played it safe. He lost some tournaments as a result, but he won a great many and achieved world fame and respect, too. There's much to be said for the conservation of assets, but it should be remembered that they tend to slow you down and put more emphasis on saving what you've got than on building for the future. Of course, there's a happy balance between conservation and innovation that should never be lost sight of. Ask yourself, what business am I in? What is its purpose? How does it contribute to the well-being of mankind? And how can I make it better? Not how can we produce more necessarily. We have almost overproduced ourselves into a world junk pile. In trying to produce more and more, many businesses have lost sight of real quality. Quantity became the god, with a small increment of profit on mountain ranges of units, gadgets, shiny junk that fell apart when the purchaser got it home, knobs that broke or fell off, buttons that came off, toys that couldn't stand the strain of being unwrapped, towering mountain ranges of shiny, worthless junk, none of it worth our time, let alone our money. There's a rapidly growing avant-garde that will one day represent the majority of the population that is determined to buy quality, and they'll go to any country to get it. We can satisfy this growing, discriminating market now and in the years ahead. Many of our fastest-growing companies are proving it. But it means going back to the old verity. Quality first, quantity second. Both can be achieved through human imagination, the most incredible agency ever to appear on earth. It all comes back to what we want, and more importantly, what we want to be as persons. A good profit and a steady growth is all that we need in business. We don't have to shoot off the top of the page. But the chances of truly spectacular growth are better via quality through imagination than through quantity for quantity's sake. It makes no difference whether it's a yo-yo or an automobile. Over the long haul, quality will win out. If the size must be reduced to maintain price and improve quality, we should make it smaller. There's always a way through imagination. You know, each of us has a gold mine between his ears. If he fails to mine the gold, well, that's his business. But it's there, all that we can want, and much more. Now, as to input, we should never stop building our store of information. We can never get an idea without raw material, which is information and application. 
If there's real talent there, too, so much the better. But talent has a way of developing with hard application, daily application, perspiration, long hours of study and deep thought. Become a sponge for information that applies to what you do. Read everything you can find on the subject. Build a fine library of books that are filled with the ideas of others on your specialty, whatever it may be. You know, my wife is a great cook. She must have 30 cookbooks. People who say they're great cooks without ever reading the ideas of others are kidding themselves. I know a writer who refuses to read the works of other writers. He's never amounted to much. Great painters have always learned more from other painters than they did from nature, and they still do. Somerset Maugham laboriously copied the style of writers he admired. I mean he would sit and copy page after page of the actual words they wrote so that he could learn how they wrote. He then wrote the stories he wanted to write with a marvelously finished skill. If we're in management, we can learn from the masters in management. Rohr, Hibbler, and Replogel's book on management and the new Dow jones Irwin book, The Enjoyment of Management by John Price are a couple of good ones to study. You know, when I first started in radio, I listened carefully to the country's best and highest paid radio personalities. They had learned their skills through many years of hard work. I learned a great deal from them. All I had to do was turn on my radio and listen. Frank Sinatra learned his amazing breath control from Tommy Dorsey, and every great performer who ever lived has had a model or models he or she studied and admired and wanted to emulate. How about you? The person who thinks he doesn't have to study his craft, art, or profession is a pompous fool, and his chances of ever amounting to much are very slim indeed. A never-ending taking in of the best thoughts of the best people in the field of our choice is the best assurance that we will never stagnate, never stop producing. Paracelsus wrote, Thoughts are free and are subject to no rule. On them rests the freedom of man, and they tower above the light of nature. For thoughts give birth to a creative force that is neither elemental or sidereal. Thoughts create a new heaven, a new firmament, a new source of energy from which new arts flow. When man undertakes to create something, he establishes a new heaven, as it were, and from it the work that he desires to create flows into him. For such is the immensity of man that he is greater than heaven and earth. He went on to write, the child is still an uncertain being, and he receives his form according to the potentialities that you awaken in him. If you awaken his ability to make shoes, he'll be a shoemaker. If you awaken the stone cutter in him, he'll be a stone cutter. And if you summon forth the scholar in him, he will be a scholar. And this can be so because all the potentialities are inherent in him. What you awaken in him comes forth from him. The rest remains unawakened, absorbed in sleep. We are born to be awake, not to be asleep. And then he wrote, Therefore, men, learn and learn, question and question, and do not be ashamed of it. For only thus can you earn a name that will resound in all countries and never be forgotten. Hope is one of the loftiest emotions we can experience, for whenever we lack hope, our fruits will also be lacking. He who knows nothing loves nothing. He who can do nothing understands nothing. He who understands nothing is worthless. But he who understands also loves, notices, sees. The more knowledge is inherent in a thing, the greater the love. Everything lies in knowledge. From it comes every fruit. Knowledge bestows faith, for he who knows God believes in him. He who does not know him does not believe in him. Everyone believes in what he knows. Everyone believes in what he knows. And there's your answer to the question, why is there so little belief in anything today? It's because we believe in what we know, and most people don't try to really know anything. Do you know where I got those great quotations of Paracelsus? From the book, The Nature of Man, which I recommended in Direct Line 1. People who say they don't have time for reading, research, and study had better find time or throw in the towel. There's no other way to make it over the long haul. You can't make wine without grapes. There must be input if there's to be output. A time spent each day in study will produce a never-ending stream of interesting, imaginative ideas we can apply to our work. It will also confer upon us a very precious thing, freedom, complete independence. We can live where we please, earn the income we desire, and have a wonderful life through the systematic development of our imaginations. Imagination is everything. What applies to our work? also applies to our leisure, our hobbies, avocations. If we play golf or tennis, it's much more enjoyable if we play well. 
Again, a systematic, never-ending study of the game or sport will keep our ability and enthusiasm growing over the years. We don't have to become obsessed with it or be a professional, but it's great to develop confidence and a real facility for the fun we enjoy, boating, fishing, skiing, flying, tennis, golf, bridge, whatever it is. It's more fun if we're fairly good at it. Working at our hobbies gives us the rest we need from the problems at work and at home. It helps us live in balance with a minimum of friction. You know, scientists are in agreement that the old biblical admonition is correct when it says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that keepeth his spirit is greater than he that taketh a city. If we can catch the vision that life is lived from within out, that it's not so much what happens around us or to us as what happens in us that counts, we can set our own pace, live our own lives, meet situations and people objectively without fear or resistances, and we can become healthier and as prosperous and happy as we want to be. Anyone who knows anything about mechanics knows that friction is the enemy. Steel wheels on rails reduce friction almost to the vanishing point, and an enormous, almost unbelievable load can be moved great distances with surprisingly little power. I had dinner in a restaurant in San Antonio the other night at the top of that great tower that was built for the hemisphere, and the owner of the restaurant told me that that entire thing turns with a a one-and-a-half horsepower motor. Steel, frictionless balls working on steel rails. We can do the same by reducing friction from our lives. The more friction, the slower we must move with greater effort. Some men in medical research go so far as to say that man has within him a health-maintaining force sufficient to keep him alive and healthy almost indefinitely, if it were not for the destructive effect of uncontrolled emotions. As James Allen wrote, The calm man, having learned how to govern himself, knows how to adapt himself to others, and they in turn reverence his strength and feel they can learn from him and rely upon him. In all the departments of living, developing calmness, serenity, is worth any effort. It typifies the great person, the true professional. It takes daily practice, especially if we're not a naturally calm or phlegmatic kind of person. The calm person moves ahead. People just naturally look to him for leadership, especially when things aren't going as they should. But not enough has been said about the contributions calmness make to good health. Good health in man, as it is in all living things, is the natural state. The body has fail-safe mechanisms that automatically go to work whenever good health is threatened. Ill health comes more often from emotional stress than anyone even dares to guess. Friction is the culprit. Developing serenity, a calm, peaceful attitude toward others, our work and our goals, will work wonders in the response we'll get. So we should calm down, slow down, and with a little discrimination as to what we allow to get through to us, we can do much more and enjoy ourselves much more with much less friction and effort. When we wake in the morning, there are a thousand distractions poised to get at us as we go through the day. They clamor at us in sound and sight. They're frantic, frenetic. They implore. They importune. They threaten. They cajole. If we'd let them, they'd keep us spinning like confused tops. We need to put a sentry at the door to our consciousness and look at the credentials of that which would enter. We can suffer from inner pollution, too. We should be choosy what we let enter our consciousness, as choosy as we are about the furnishings in our homes. A great educator once said something to the effect that the most interesting people are the people with the most interesting pictures in their minds. If you will think of the things that clamor for your attention as paintings waiting to hang on your walls, you can become very selective. A salesman was talking to a farmer who was very much interested in what he was selling. They were standing in the shade of a tree near the house when the sound of the telephones ringing reached them. The farmer made no attempt to leave. Finally, the salesman mentioned that the phone was ringing, and the farmer commented that he'd had that thing installed for his convenience, not for anyone else's, and went on with the conversation. There is a way to restore charm and interest to our lives, and it seems to be to cut down on the number of things we let engage our attention and make certain that what does get through is good. I had the good fortune to be raised near a harbor, As a kid, I used to spend hours down in the docks watching the ships loading and unloading. They'd bring in cargoes from the distant and romantic ports all over the world, and I used to stand there with a faraway look in my eyes, envying those sailors who were so fortunate. They traveled over the distant horizon to places I could only imagine or read about in my geography books. I hung around so much that some of the mates and skippers finally recognized me and actually invited me on board. I guess you can imagine the heaven that was for me. 
They'd take me from the engine room to the forecastle and find it the place I liked best, the navigation bridge. The bridge had the best view, but more than that, it was there that the ship was controlled and steered into all those distant places I dreamed of. Once I was even invited to lunch. I didn't get over that for months. It's strange how something like that can have such an overwhelming fascination for a youngster and exert such an influence over his life. As soon as I was old enough, I was on a ship, and I sailed to quite a few of those distant deep-water ports. No matter how long the trip, I never got tired of sailing and watching the sea in all its different moods. Entering a distant port, even if I'd been there before, was always a brand new thrill. Over the years, I've tried to figure out why I like ships so much, and I believe I've come up with the answer. Ships operate during their entire lives the way we should, but so few do. Maybe you've never thought much about it, but at any given moment, a ship is 100% successful. That is, it's either sailing to a predetermined port of call, or it's in port getting ready to sail to another one. A ship owner is smart. He knows a ship can only reach one port of call at a time. You never see any doubt or confusion, or trying to do more than one thing at a time. You can climb up to the navigation bridge of a big, far-sailing ship and ask the captain where he's going, and he'll tell you instantly and in one sentence. How many people do you know who can do the same thing? It seems that most people want so many different things, most of which they're not really sure of, that they're like the guy who jumped on the horse and rode off in all directions at once. What they ought to do is recognize the truth and success of a ship. Pick one port that's important. Sail to it. Then rest and refit for a little while, then sail to another important port. In this way, in not too many years, a man can set and reach his goals one by one until finally he's got a tremendous pile of accomplishments in which he can take pride. He's got all the things he wants, just because he had sense enough to realize he could only do well one thing at a time. There's one other point that fits in here, and maybe it's the most important of all. If a ship tied up to a dock, for some reason had no place to go, it would stay there until it fell apart from rust and disuse. Ships don't start their engines until they have some place to go. And here again, it's the same with men. This is why it's so important that each of us have a port of call we want to reach, a goal, a place to get to that we feel will be better than the place in which we now find ourselves. If we don't, well, we might never cast off. We might never know the thrill of sailing a pre-charted course to a place we can't see for fully 99% of the journey. But we know it's there, and we know that if we keep sailing toward it, We'll reach it. You see, ships have a way of reaching their ports. If someone came up to you today and asked you what your next port of call is, that is, where you're going, could you answer him in one sentence like the captain could on the bridge of his ship? If not, maybe you'd better give it some thought. As soon as I was able and had the time to devote to it, I got a boat of my own. I find it to be a wonderfully restful hobby. With a good boat, you own a home anywhere on earth. Since 76% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, there are a few places you can't go if you happen to love boats, as I do. With our little ship, we have a home in Florida, the Bahamas, the Virgin Islands, the Grenadines, South America, Central America, or Mexico. It can take us wherever we want to go, with no packing and unpacking, with our meals when we want them, and good fishing and swimming along the way. And as Dana wrote back in 1830 in the American classic, two years before the mast, a ship is like a lady's watch, always out of repair so you're never at a loss for something to do. There are always a dozen things waiting to be done. It makes for an interesting, busy hobby, with lots of fresh air and sunshine. It's especially good in the winter when you can't play golf up north. The great William James, in his Principles of Psychology, defined genius as little more than the faculty of perceiving in an unhabitual way. In his essay on habit, he referred to habit as the flywheel of society. It's what keeps us doing what we've been doing in the past. It makes us fear change regardless of the present condition of our lives. And the genius, as defined by Dr. James, seems to be that rare bird who knows that change is not only good, but inevitable. He anticipates the inevitable. He's perhaps what makes change inevitable. He habitually looks at everything about him in an unhabitual way. He takes nothing for granted. He knows that whatever he sees that is made by man or served by man is imperfect, is always in a state of evolving. Let me give you a good example. A friend of mine was looking for a site for a large luxury motel. He was in no hurry and spent months in a certain West Coast city looking for the site that would probably best guarantee a good return on the considerable amount of money he was going to invest and borrow. He found the perfect site. It was near a large university and at the confluence of five main roads, one of which was a heavily traveled highway. It was also within the city limits, which would mean a large local trade for the restaurant. 
There was only one hitch. On the site was an old brick building, an old manufacturing concern, still in business. Well, he called on the owners of the business and told them what he wanted to do. Since the city had, over the years, grown around the old building, he pointed out that it would be to their benefit to sell him the property at a price many times the land's original value and build themselves a new, more modern plant in a less congested area. Well, they saw the sense of his plan and a way to pick up nearly half a million dollars for their property and closed the deal. He raised the old building and built his beautiful new motel. Later, he discovered that many people in the motel business had looked upon that site as ideal for their purposes, but had written it off because it was already occupied. He saw it not with the old brick manufactory on it, but instead with his beautiful new motel sitting there. He had looked at that corner in an unhabitual way. Everybody benefited, including the community, by his genius. I think each of us can greatly increase the value of his life by taking to heart Dr. James' definition of genius, by looking at things about us, in our home, and particularly in our work, with new eyes, with the eyes of creation. We can form the habit of seeing things not as they are, but as they perhaps will be, as they could be, as our changing world will insist they be in the future. Our lives are full of old brick buildings that have stood there for too long. We just don't see them anymore. Or if we do, we just assume they'll always be there. And maybe they always will, if we don't do something about them. In case the idea impressed you as much as it did me, here's Dr. William James' definition of genius again. You might want to remember it. Genius is little more than the faculty of perceiving in an unhabitual way. Speaking of Dr. William James, he also had something to say about the interesting phenomenon known as second wind. In his essay on vital reserves, he points out that everyone knows what it is to start a piece of work, mental or physical, feeling stale, and we know what it is to warm up to a job. But before too long, we feel the first signs of fatigue. As Dr. James put it, we have then walked, played, or worked enough, so we desist. We simply quit. This sort of fatigue forms a kind of barrier behind which the great majority of people live and work. But if an unusual necessity forces us to press onward, as James put it, a surprising thing happens. The fatigue gets worse up to a certain critical point. Then gradually or suddenly it passes away, and we're fresher than before. We have evidently tapped a level of new energy, a second wind, masked until then by the fatigue obstacle we usually obey. In fact, we may find that we have third and fourth winds. The phenomenon occurs in cases of mental activity as well as physical, and in exceptional cases we may find, beyond the very extremity of fatigue, distress, stores of ease and power we never dreamed ourselves to own. It's evident that we have stockpiled reserves of energy that are ordinarily not called upon, but that may be called upon, deeper and deeper strata of power, ready for use by anyone who probes so deeply. I remember one Sunday when I had to write twenty radio programs to be recorded on Monday. I got started at nine in the morning, and by five in the afternoon I was bushed, but I had ten more shows to write, so I kept at it. Suddenly I felt better and had more energy than at any previous time and by 1.30 the next morning, when I finally completed program number 20, I felt great. I felt I could keep going forever. Sixteen and a half hours of steady mental work and typing, and I was fresher than when I started. Great things are done by so-called high-energy people, but I'm sure most of us don't know about or forget about the great reserves of energy which lie dormant in us. Each of us has a tremendous second wind, mentally and physically. Passing through the fatigue barrier to reach these deep reservoirs can make the difference between ordinary or unusual success, between existing and really living. It's good to know we have it.